That's it. You got it. You got it. We got it. Okay. We got it. Yeah. Yeah, it was a little yeah, uh, range. Yeah, the stream should have the PowerPoint now. Well, it does have it. Yeah. It does what it shows now. All right. Mm-hmm. We gotta do this. Still in the yeah. yeah just, no, we gotta start. Alright, awesome. Jeez. Technical difficulties. <laughs> All right, guys. We're about to start off. Yeah, you can. You can. You can. Alright, so this presentation. Uh, my name is Greg. Uh, I'm a malware analyst, and um, this presentation is going to be about Yara. Um, I don't know if anybody knows or heard of what Yara is or how it's used, but uh, we're going to go over some of the basics. I'm going to explain what it is, how to write Yara rules, uh, how to use it, and um, and we're going to go to, um, and do some hands-on as well, you know, so we can understand how a Yara rule. Um, I've got to go pretty much is written to how to break it down and how to analyze the Yara rule. So like I said, uh, some of the topic, topics we'll cover is what is Yara, uh, what's in a Yara rule, how to write them, how not to write them, uh, how to use Yara. Uh, there are a lot of features that we're not going to cover today, but I'm going to mention them. And also the documentation website for Yara is fantastic. You can read it in like 30 minutes and pretty much learn about everything you need to know about Yara. And then we're going to do a little hands-on, uh, look at some rules, maybe write some rules. Okay, what is Yara? Yara is a tool aimed at, but not limited to helping malware researchers to identify and classify malware samples uh, because I'm a malware analyst most of what I'm going to be talking about is from a malware analyst point of view but um, you'll see that you can pretty much use this tool um, for anything uh, Yara uses a pattern matching uses pattern matching to describe behaviors or data so what we'll see well you'll notice that uh, we're going to be writing things that kind of look like what you would write on a command line to search for for files or for strings, even on Linux, you know, you can use grep and things like that. Yara rule, yeah. So Yara rules kind of mimic that kind of behavior. They just kind of put it in a nice little format for you to use. So what Yara allows uh, the user to do is match certain characteristics or behavior patterns. So think of IDS is uh, like Pro IDS, Suricata, things like that. You you write these rules that capture certain network behaviors. Well, Yara is kind of the same thing. It can work on any kind of data stream. You can tie it to a network um, based protocol if you want. You can use it um, as a host based detection solution as well. Um, and there's an interesting project for host intrusion prevention. Even you can um, use it almost like an antivirus because all these rules are signatures, pretty much. Uh, it provides a Python library, so if you're a Python programmer, it, it also provides a library and a framework to use it within your own code. Also, it provides a C API. All right, so uh, what's in a Yara rule? Uh, I'm gonna talk about this stuff, but just keep it in the back of your mind because once I talk about it, we'll actually get to see some rules. That way we can put the information into context. Uh, basic Yara rule defines a certain condition. Uh, Yara contains a lot of keywords. Just like any programming language, there's keywords you can use within a Yara rule that you shouldn't uh, use anywhere else. Um, just like any programming language, you can't use a variable called for or something. Reserved words? Yeah, reserved words, pretty much reserved keywords. Uh, identifiers are like your variables in programming languages. Identifiers, you're going to assign these strings that you're looking for and identifiers. And identifiers follow the same lexical rules as the C programming languages. Meaning the first, char the first character of an identifier can't be a digit. You can use uh, alphanumeric or underscores 
for your identifiers. The uh, the norm with uh, most Yara writers is to use the uh, dollar symbol with their variables, almost like what, PHP. Here are some of the reserve words. Actually, I think these are all of the reserve words for Yara. You can find these also in the documentation website. So we'll, we'll take a closer look at some of these. Uh, one of them is deprecated. We'll, I'll explain why uh, later. All right, so most Yara rules contain both strings and conditions. So you define strings that you're looking for, which is kind of the behaviors you're looking for, and the conditions are how you want to act against those behaviors. Strings can be a range of identifiers. So typically, you'll, you'll be looking for plain strings, hexadecimal data, regular expressions, and a very, uh, very primitive wildcard expressions and jump expressions. Strings can also be enforced by modifiers. So if you're searching for a string that's, say, uh, Unicode, you can Ident uh, identify it, you can enforce the modifier by telling it to only look for this string as a wide string, all right? not as an, a as an ASCII string. So wide strings, you'll, you'll, you'll find those mostly in Windows binaries that uh, use Unicode strings. If you don't put that modifier wide and you are looking for a wide string, that rule won't hit. By default, Yara looks for ASCII strings, so it's important. Uh, a lot of these modifiers are important. Full word is also another important one. If you put a string uh, such as domain and you're looking for a binary or data stream with the word domain in it and you don't put full word, it'll match any string with the word domain in it. Now, if that's not the behavior you want, you want to enforce the modifier full word to only search for that data stream, for that string. What happens if it's a back binary? We'll, we'll look at that as well. If you, typically, you want to identify pack binaries by their packers identifiers. So UPX, for example, you'll search for the strings UPX because that shows up in the name section sometimes. Or we can look. We're going to look at a little more advanced ways to uh, define a sequence of hexadecimal strings that can identify that packer. Every packer has a unique signature. And we can identify them from those. All right, strings and modifiers. Like I was saying, I, I explained it in the last. Uh, text strings and regular expressions can be enforced with modifiers. Right, so you can modify, you can uh, enforce wide to search only for wide strings. Uh, the note here is that it's not truly UTF-16 wide strings. So all it does is it looks for the ASCII and a zero zero to cover that 16 bit so, so if it's an actual true Unicode string with the actual 16 bit characters you want to search for it in a hexadecimal not as a string Does that, did that confuse anybody? oh alright uh, ASCII no case that just says not case sensitive and forward Regular expressions in Yara, it's its own regular expression. But if you're familiar with the PCR, it doesn't support is capture groups in regular expressions. Um, right. So the Yara documentation does provide a more in-depth look into exactly what the um, what regular expressions are are supported in Yara. They just support. Extended characters, meaning um, foreign languages, or is this something? You, I guess you could write, you could write a regular expression for it, but okay, just I, like the you, the uh, wide string is not truly UTF-16, so it doesn't support actually different languages because some languages use the whole 16-bit width of the Unicode so I have specification. To search in, uh, hex. Yeah, search it by hex. I would search it by hex if you if you're uh, Doing foreign languages, so like you can't put Chinese characters in the uh, in the quotes. All right, how do you write a Yara rule? 
So it's a text-based uh, system. You open up any text editor and you start by writing your rule name, strings, and conditions. Before you start writing uh, a Yara rule, obviously you want to already have an idea of what you're searching for. So that's the intelligence gathering phase. Get the strings necessary or get the data that you want from that data stream to capture more of it. In a malware point of view, you analyze one malware, find some unique characteristics of that malware, write a YAR rule, just plug it into a system that has a large repository of malware, say Virus Total or an antivirus uh, company, and you can find all the matches of that same or similar malware based on that signature. So the rule name typically, typically corresponds to the target you're trying to identify. So the malware family, the malware name, or the text file, or that picture you accidentally sent to someone you shouldn't have, whatever. Uh, multiple rules can reside in one file. So you, it, it doesn't have to be one rule per file. You can write several rules in one file. Uh, the tag name, you, so you can also have a tag name next to the rule name. Uh, tags are usually used to filter the output and we'll see that on the hands-on. We'll see how the tags are related to, to separating the output. Uh, the strings. So when you're writing strings for Yara, you want to use uniquely identifying string data. All right, so the, the whole point is so that you're not, you're not getting false positives. So you don't want to use, um, like, uh, I'll, I'll have some good examples <laughs> once we get to those slides. Uh, be aware of stat statically compiled libraries. So for anybody who programs, you'll, you'll know that you can compile a, a program, usually in, in a high-level language, either statically or dynamically. Statically is all the libraries are embedded into the executable, and dynamically is they load the libraries they need at runtime. You don't want to have uh, strings that come from static, statically compiled libraries just because you might hit a lot of false positives. There's a lot of programs out there that could use OpenSSL library. So you don't want strings from the OpenSSL library in your strings condition unless that's a unique identifier for that particular malware. Uh, hexadecimal strings should contain also fairly unique sequences to minimize um, false positives. So you don't want to use a you don't want to use a a function prologue as a hexadecimal um, identification. So the function prologue is just the first sequence of bytes most functions have when they start up, like preserving the stack, push EVP, move EVP, SP. You don't want to use the byte strings for those because almost every function has that. So the idea is to find string data that can be cr found across all versions of the library, or the binary, sorry. So that's the idea. The idea is to find some strings that just pop out to you like, oh, maybe all the versions of this malware has this particular string just to try to find more of it. And we already talked about modifiers. I talk about modifiers a lot because that's one of my kind of rule of thumbs. When you're using string data, use a modifier. Uh, it doesn't hurt uh, to, to use them. You can use more than one at a time. You can use ASCII and Y together, which will let y'all search for either ASCII or the wide representation of that character. Um, and forward is an important one. Um, I would use it almost 90% of the cases. Okay. All right, so conditions. So here we have a, just an excerpt of a YAR rule. You have the strings here. Here's your identifiers, the variables. Here are the string data, and here are the modifiers. Down here we have conditions. So conditions are the logic of your rule. These are like kind of like the bread and butter here. Conditions are required on every rule. However, string data are not required. We'll see later how we can use a rule without string data, but only conditions to find certain behaviors or characteristics. All right. So in this, we have 
a list of strings that I found in this piece of malware, use the full word modifier, and then in my condition, I only want to find eight of all instances of these strings. Well, not instances, but only eight matches. If I return at least eight matches on this rule set, then that malware it resolves to true. Yeah, it resolves to true. All right. So conditions, you can do a lot with conditions. You'll see. We'll see later that uh, conditions are kind of like that. That's where you really want to put your your effort into uh, your rules, right? So you can do things like relative byte distance. So if I have a, a stream of bytes or a hexadecimal characters, whatever, and I know that sometimes the next sequence of bytes I'm looking for is 16 bytes away, I can write a Yara rule that can capture that kind of logic. So I have this bytes, 16 bytes separate, I wanna only match if this sequence of bytes is 16 bytes far from. What would be the, the purpose of that? Like, what if they had to add If, usually that's used in more like polymorphic code. So viruses can come in different, um, in different forms. If you will. <laughs> they have the same logic, but it comes in different sizes, different sequence of instructions. But there's some instructions you you can't replace, yeah. or they won't replace. And so you find those. I'm gonna show an example of that when we do the hands-on. Uh, you can count occurrences of strings. So this, you have the identifier B equals a string. And if that string shows up more than three times in a binary, we can write a condition saying the count of this identifier is greater than three. So if that string shows up more than three times in this binary, we have a match. String offsets or virtual addresses. This is another uh, important one. So if you know that a particular piece of data always shows up at offset 100 in that data stream or in that binary, we can say this identifier at 100 and this next identifier at 200. 100 and 200 are virtual offsets from the file. All right. Uh, range base. So it's almost kind of like the relative byte distance, but this can show us a range. Yeah. So this you can you can constrain it to a range of bytes. So if you want to start from the beginning of the the data stream or the beginning of the binary, all the way up to the the 100th byte, that's the only place that this identifier can show up. And that'll amount. That'll equal to true. So you can do a lot of flexible things. You don't just search a string and hope you you hit it or not. And there's many more conditions. Uh, many more conditions. All of them. Any of them. So this covers all of the strings in your rule. This covers any of them. So if it matches one, true. Uh, all of the A identifiers or any of A, B, or C. Identifier, so it's really a game of logic. If you know your Boolean logic, or if you remember discrete math, uh, then you really enjoy this part. So who publishes uh, Yara rules? Uh, you can find Yara rules in almost all security publications now. Uh, if it's a public security publication, usually they'll have it. Uh, FireEye. Uh, Spursky, GitHub. You can find them in GitHub. I I have mine's public. Um, so it's how close is to their signature file? What's that? Or AV? It's not very close. It's not really close. No, it's not very close. The the AVs they use HIPS engines. They use a lot of uh, different mechanisms. Um, what's that one? Um, I forgot what it was called. But um. Yeah, they use the heuristics mainly, so you can actually write a Yara rule that behaves like an AV um, signature. That's what it. That's what it is. That's what it is. It's just an open source and free way to do it. All right, because AVs they have their their files encrypted. They have their signatures encrypted and stuff like that. But you can find you can find Yara rules in the public. That's what it was it was made for. All right, so we know how to write them, how not to write Yara rules. There are some things you want to avoid doing so you don't write 
uh, bad rules. All right. Like I said before, don't use function prologs or epilogs as strings. Uh, don't use the sequence that that starts a function or ends a function, because uh, most functions, if they were compiled in a high-level language, they're going to look the same. Uh, avoid using inline versions of C standard functions. So sometimes you'll find that there's like a mem set or mem zero implementation inside a function. Avoid those because those can be found anywhere. Anybody can roll out their own mem zero or mem mem set functions. Uh, those are not unique. Right? You want to look for unique patterns. Uh, avoid common library names. You don't want to use kernel32.dll as a string identifier. Almost every Windows executable has that in it. Right? Avoid using register opcodes and long sequence of operations. This one's a little harder. This one's a little more um, complicated. But basically, if you have a sequence of instructions that uses um, registers, those register values can change. If say the malware author recompiles the ex the malware or something, so you you want to avoid those, and you can with Yara. There's masking values that you can use, so we'll see that in some of the uh, the rules we analyze. Very short short sequences, short hex strings or replicated byte sequence. <clears throat> if you're looking for a code sequence, my rule of thumb is to keep it five bytes or more. For data, four bytes or more. Avoid sequence of the same bytes. So don't search for FF, FF, FF. That's going to show up a lot in some binaries. Or not at all, but you're, you're going to be wasting a lot of uh, CPU cycles on that. Certainly. If the short sequence is important, use the count condition. So if you do have to use a really short sequence, find a lot of them. Find a condition, yeah, find a condition that satisfies what you're looking for. So if it's a short sequence of bytes and it shows up, um, I don't know, 25 times or more, uh, place that condition so Yara doesn't waste its time. Because you will get an error. There, there's an error called uh, error too many matches in Yara. So you don't want to, you don't want to break your scanning. All right, so, all right, so we're getting close to the end of trying to, to get to the hands-on. I wrote a document on how to install Yara. It's publicly av available on a Google Doc. And um gosh, come on. Oh, I guess I screwed that up. Ah, oh, here it is. So I wrote it um a document. Well I guess we'll put it on the, the YouTube video. video. Put it on YouTube. It's very simple to install Yara. Uh, anyone, anyone can do it. All right, and I, I laid out the steps sequentially for you. And I have a little usage instructions just to get started. All right. How do I get back to my presentation? Oh, All right. Awesome. Works. All right, so using Yara. So we talked about writing Yara rules, but how do we use them, right? There's a command line interface for it. There's a tool that comes with Yara that actually does the, the scanning. It interprets your rules, parses your rules, and you can scan against a directory, uh, running pro process, memory, any data stream you want. You can run Yara rule against it. Um, and it, and the, the syntax is really simple. You got the rule file as your first argument and you have a directory or a file or a PID as your second argument. All right. The Yara, Yara also comes with a <laughs> compiler. It compiles your rules down into bytecode. What that does is just a speed advantage. If you're processing a lot of rules a lot of times, you want to compile the rules and have Yara process the compiled rules. Because every time you run a rule, it has to parse it, reparse it, you know, and then scan. So you want the compiled version of it. You can use Yara from within Python. Uh, that's beyond the scope of this particular presentation, but if you want, the entire documentation is right there. Uh, the CAPI as well is documented. 
Um, and the preferred method is, is command line for, for most people. Uh, large corporations, I, I pro they probably roll out their own version of it since it is open source. So they probably have a modified version of it. And uh, Yara is also integrated with a lot of popular and free open source tools. So Cuckoo, Sandbox, uh, you can plug Yara into that. Volatility, you can scan memory, uh, which is really useful. Uh, that 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 the volatility uh, <laughs> plugin is, is is a really nice touch to memory forensics. Uh, some of the features we didn't cover: um, external variables. You can write rules that only get processed if you pass an external variable to Yara. And that's through the command line when you're using Yara. Yeah. So kind of, kind of, if you have a large rule set and you only want to run rules that satisfy this external condition, then your Yara rules will parse the external condition and only run that particular rule. Uh, you can write modules. This was introduced in Yara 3.0, yeah. which is a really great addition. It's one of the best additions Yara put is the ability to write modules. So it's pretty much extending Yara's abilities to scan. So there's already some that come out the box. PE module, which is able to parse PE files. Cuckoo module, that can automatically upload you know, files that match a certain signature to Cuckoo automatically. Uh, ELF parses Linux binaries. Yes. ELF files, uh, the magic, uh, hash, and math math, you can do like entropy checks against data streams and stuff like that. Includes, uh, which is another important feature that you guys should know about. If you write a lot of rules, you keep a rules in a directory, um, you can just write one rule in a parent directory that includes all those files. And then you just run that parent rule. And so it includes all those files and that automatically includes all these rules for you. I guess it's another organization feature. Uh, you can write private and global rules. So private rules are just rules that if that condition is met for that rule, then continue running other rules. Uh, global rules kind of act almost as the same, but it's like a blanket rule. Uh, check out the documentations. Uh, I think Yara is one of the best uh, documented free open source tools out there. All right, so stop talking theory and uh, let's see if we can look at some uh, some actual Yara rules today. Streaming is going to be a pain. No. is really complicated to use. Why is it not working? Man. This again. Do you know how to freaking trying to uh, just show the hour rules? We're gonna do some hands-ons. Right. Uh, you have to just minimize it and move it over. What is that? Oh, 
is the screen, dude? I don't know. I'll move it over. No, let's move it there. Just put it there. It is, but why is it, what is that? Why is it not showing up? That's your other destiny. Is it, is it um we'll do the right to the right screen yeah it shows up there's no other screen though. what desktop is that I don't have three desktops running what uh if you don't if you don't need two desktops this is what you need to do go into systems mm -hmm. then tell it uh, duplicate you go here until the arrangement. Uh, mirror. There you go. Okay. All right. So we've got the basic yarrow rule. Like I uh, remember how I was explaining, a yarrow rule only requires a condition. It is the base, the most basic yarrow rule you can write. The meta, the meta tags. That's also optional. That kind of just identifies author things. You can put a lot of different things in the meta tag uh, just to kind of identify your rule. But it doesn't affect uh, the actual Yara rule. So remember when we were talking about the uh, the modules? So with the latest Yara, you can import a module. And then after that, you can use the functionality of that module. Also remember, I said we didn't need a strings. Uh, we didn't need a strings conditions or the strings uh, section to write a useful yarrow rule. For example, this yarrow rule. If I wanted to find all the files that are DLL files in a directory or wherever, I can use the PE module, and in my condition, PE characteristics. And it with pe.dll. What is what is the live stream showing? The live stream is showing your whatever is. Uh... Yeah, it's showing the whatever is behind it. Yeah, that's what it's showing. Yeah. This? Yeah, what you, what you see there in the box, that's what it's showing. The whole the whole thing. screen in that gray box. Yeah, you may have the change the settings. Uh, where is that uh, dog? No, 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 no. It doesn't even have it. Display. No. Okay. Well, what, what is that? A setting? Which one? The, uh, the beach? Yeah. That was like 15 minutes. Yeah, the guy is in within 15 minutes. I want to stream just the uh, 15 minutes. One file. What is yeah. that? Yeah. yeah. I think that's dropping the size of the screen to the size of that. Yeah. Oh, I'm looking for a sublime, but it's not there. Yeah. But I would have liked to just have that. It's showing this screen, the stream? That's what it's showing right now. So maybe I need to move the... Uh, this? You need to put that on display capture. See so you now. I'll just put that there then. Alright, let me know if you guys see this after like 15, 20 yeah, seconds. Yeah, you can give it Not showing yet. Yeah, 
Yeah, so what we do? Display capture. Oh, do cancel. Yeah, do cancel. Cancel that. Okay. 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 All right. Display capture. This is for Okay, so then move it. We gotta move the. We gotta move the. Uh, um, the sublime text to that display capture. Thought it was there. Did you move it into it? See if I have to go on the display capture now. Click in there. No, it's still not there. So we'll move it again. That's the one. See that? Like it doesn't right. show up there though. See, hit uh, him. Uh, no, he actually actually do the plus. Uh, text or whatever. Window capture. Yeah. Man, this, this software is a pain in the ass. It is, man. Right? What the hell? I don't understand why this doesn't just show up. You do that and the stream fails. Display one, display two. It's almost like that. Yeah, delete that. Delete that. Okay, so what you got there? Just this one. It's almost like it's just showing the same thing again. You see that? So. Oh, it was moving right there. Uh huh. Move it. Do do that and then just move to the text. Well, I'm just moving the screen over. It's not really. It's not showing what I want it to show. It's not really. It's see that? But when you watch. It when should you did, show you that. See how it's moving now? Okay. So this should, should show up. But right. See. I can see it. This is right there. You go. Okay. okay, now it went away. But it was working? It show, yeah. So it should, it should go yeah. back to this. Yeah, you Okay. Ah, oh, sorry guys. I don't know none of this equipment. Alright, so... So here we use an import module and then we only use the condition. This would return all files that are identified as DLL files. Uh, for this one, same deal. We wrote a rule, we imported the PE module. Here's where the tags go. So you have your rule name. Yes. Can I stop you real quick? So <coughs> we just said that that previous rule that we looked at, if I ran that on a directory, it would return back every file in the directory that was DLL. So is it is Yara going through each file in that directory and then looking at the looking at the binary itself and then matching on any conditions that you would have put inside of your rule and yeah, so it passes the data stream. Mm -hmm. Yara passes the data stream to the rule. In this particular rule, the PE module also processes the data stream. And the PE module is built specifically to identify characteristics in a PE file. Right. So when it grab, when it checks the condition against that chunk, that data chunk, it sees, ah. it knows where to look for, for that particular characteristic gotcha, gotcha. in the PE file header. That was built into the PE module. Yeah, gotcha, this gotcha. is built into the PE module. If you don't import P, you can't use this gotcha. particular condition. All right, so this one's the same. You import the PE module. And for this one, I'm looking for a file that has three sections and is an executable image, All right? So that's gonna return any file with three sections, exactly three sections, and is a PE executable file. So that's just examples of using the modules and only conditions. Uh, the other one we talked about 
are strings. So this is the basic rule with some strings data. So we're looking for this particular string in the binary. Well, all these particular strings. I showed you here, 0, 2 has domain without the full word uh, modifier. This rule will match any word with domain in it. This rule, S03, is going to match only the word domain. So that's just to show you guys the difference. This here is going to search for any word with just this is a string, and it can be ASCII or it can be Y. So, if, so this is a more a lot more flexible, gives you a lot more flexibility. So here we talked about the byte distance. All right, so here's a sample of the data chunk I'm looking for. All right, I have my my string identified as the first five, four bytes of that data stream. I don't care what happens in between here, but I know that 10 bytes later, always I'm gonna see 88, 99. So how do I write that? There's a lot of ways to write that. In a condition, I can write for all of the strings A, unsigned integer 16, the at symbol, identifies the current location of A. So when A is matched, this particular identifier is going to have the location of that string. And 10 bytes from that, I have to see 9988. Now, I wrote it like this because if you guys know the difference between little and big Indian, in memory it's going to look like this, but in actuality, you know, the integer is going to be reversed. Do they have, uh, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Question. So the at is the pointer for for this for, for this the, yeah for the string so a. Do you have, does it have another character for the offset for where it ends where the string ends? Or you have to calculate? All this? Yeah, it calculates from. That's actually a good question. I think it calculates from the end of that pointer. So. It's going to calculate from this position at the end, and then you add the 10 bytes, so you have, no, actually, I'm so wrong. It's, it's the beginning. It's the beginning. It's the beginning. So it doesn't, you, you don't have built-in a character that tells you where the string ends. You, well, you can, well, the A, the A identifier is four bytes, but I see what you mean. If you want to make sure that, but why would you use that? How would you use that? Because you have you have the string data here, which is four bytes. Every match of this four byte sequence, the pointer will be at the beginning, and then it'll count ten, right? Ten, yeah. I actually have it wrong. It's actually supposed to be sixteen. Because I might want to look for something that's after the end of the string, not the beginning, right? From a relative distance yeah, from so it, or right was, after? You would say like if if you know that. C2 starts with C2 hosts, right? Mm -hmm. And then you want to get the, whatever the host name is exactly that. So you want to match here, but capture here. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're, you're not going to... Yara is not built to capture any data. You have to tell it what to look it's for. Just yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a signature base. So okay. you're not going to extract any information from it, but you can probably write a rule where if you find that C2 host, dump the next 32 bytes or something. Right. Instead Maybe instead you can do something like that. Right? Or, like I was saying, you can use wildcards. So, for instance, say you have, you're looking for B A D F O D E D D, right? But everything that comes after here might be something you. You want it, but you're not worried about it because you don't want to match exactly. You can just pass it like that and use that. As your string identifier. Right, so you know that C2 host, and then there's some stuff that comes after it, but, but in, the, in the results you have the location of that 
of where that happens. And then after that, you look in that location and you find your host name. But that's the beauty of actually modules. You could probably write a module that extracts data like that. All right, so the modules gives you that flexibility to write whatever you want. So in the conditions, you might be able to write something that says uh, extract dot next 10 bytes, and you can dump that to a file or something. Right? So the modules gives you more flexibility. Yara is just signature scanning. They don't want to put too much into it, then it becomes a tool that you don't understand. So they let you modify it the way you want. And this Sublime extension, you wrote it, or it's available? Was that? The Sublime extension is available, or you wrote it? For the color syntax? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's available. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Sublime has it. It's not good, but it works. <laughs> yeah, because they, they, they kind of screwed up with the, uh, the quotations and stuff. You'll see some of the rules get messed up. But another way to do this, and just the strings is just like this, right? You can have the the next 16 or next 14 bytes as this, and you can look for that sequence, right? So ignore everything in here, but make sure that 16 bytes after, right? And it works in a nibble case. It works in nibble case, so you can have something like this, right? Yeah. So it works on nibbles. It doesn't work at the byte level, it works at the, at the bit level. So that's actually really good. Uh, let's see. All right, we have some other examples here. This right here is an example of a compiled rule. All right, after I ran, I don't want to mess this thing up again. performance performance if you're running a rule multiple times a lot of times you want to use it in its compiled format all right and that's just this rule here so this rule is interesting I wrote this rule um, uh, the other day for uh, for a piece of malware so here I have the MZ which is the seriously but it should it should it should go away. Okay, cool. All right, so for here, I'm looking for this signature at the beginning of the file, which is the MZ header for a PE file, and then I'm matching this byte sequence. Now, this sequence, after doing analysis, I know shows up only in the first 100 bytes of the entry point of the program. So only where the, the program actually starts executing. So between that point and 100 bytes chunk, this sequence of code happens. So that's, all, that's the only place I want Yara to look for that sequence of byte. And so I use the A, N, range. So I use that range and then match all these other hex strings and it has to have all three of these so this rule is specific to this particular uh, malware so I can send that up to a friend in AV and say hey run this rule see how many samples you can get and so it'll capture that particular uh, malware because this is a unique identification for it so what you're doing there is, is optimizing because you want to find A first and then you match B C D. Yeah. But so it's, it's an AND condition, so all these conditions have to be met. Yeah. So you could put in an A, B, C, D in that is the same? same. Well, if I, if I put AND all of A, B, C, D, it'll search for this instance of A in the whole file. Now, what I, the reason why I don't want that oh. is because this sequence of bytes yeah. might show up in other places. So A has to be there. A has to be in this be range. Anywhere. Yeah. A has to be between the, the entry point and 100 bytes chunk after the, entry point, yeah. after the entry point. If it doesn't show up there, it's not my file. I'm not looking anywhere and, else. And then, and then, then find the rest. And yeah. Also the rest of it, yeah. So it'll find these regardless. Even if this condition turns true and this doesn't, it's the condition's false. false. false yeah. Right? Yeah. Because you're, it's, it's, it's an and. Everything yeah. has to 
as to equate to true. Okay, I showed this one. This was the one I had in the PowerPoint where I found a lot of interesting uh, string data. But a uh, some of them I were questionable. Some of them were questionable. So I was like, okay, VB run might show up in any Visual Basic file. But I am looking for a vis Visual Basic version of this malware. So I'm going to have that in there. Uh, browser Facebook, that's obviously not going to be in every file, right? Because it's particular to that malware. And, uh, uh, meth, meth call engine, what is that? I don't know. It's weird. Oh, actually, that's a Visual Basic uh, stub. Oh, yeah? Yeah. But, uh, but the idea of only matching eight of these strings is I want to match over 50% of these strings. Yep. And so I picked eight as well, just an arbitrary number. You find other patterns, right? right. So if I, if I said all of them, it would kind of constrain my search, right? So all of these strings might only show up in the particular malware I was looking at, right? And if they modified it and one of these strings disappeared, I'm missing out on a whole bunch of similar malware. What was this, though? Black, Black Shades. What? Black Shades. Oh, really? Yeah, this is what I wrote. Stacking Huh? You were smoking with baseball stuff? Oh, yeah. it, it, I mean, it was a rat, so it was, that's it was, how, that's how it it was getting a lot that's, of data. That's one of the ways that it spread. They wrote a... It was like a watering hole attack that they did. They put it on Facebook, and then a whole bunch of people started downloading it. Yeah. So, you know, I wanted to match eight of... And you'll see see the asterisks here. This is interesting. So if I write all my rules with F, S, uh, and then number them, I don't have to write it. Eight yeah. of S, A, B, C, zero, one. Yeah. You know, I can just put the asterisk and it matches all of the strings that match that particular identifier. All right, so let's look at one that's for. So this is for a Linux uh, base. This is for the IP tables. All right, this is one I wrote for IP tables. And you'll see here I have the ELF identifier. This is the first uh, sequence of bytes that identifies an ELF file. So I want to make sure I'm only looking at L files, sure. L files, right? Because anybody can write a text file with all these words, and it'll match, yep. right? So I want to make sure that that matches that first one, and then I have all of these strings and five of these strings. Now the reason why I use only five of these strings is because again, if I if I have all of them and one of them changes, I might miss out on a hit. So I never, I never particularly like using every single string that I find, especially when it's something like source code. Yeah, those are all, yeah, those are all very you know, used so, libraries. Right. They, so they they might compile it with a different sure. set of you know source code, and I'm gonna miss out on that. Yep. But this is actually not something I do. This is like my first rules, so I don't do this anymore. If I see what? source code names, I try to avoid them. Sure. Because that's just a, yeah. that's probably it's just common. a programmer error, you know. They, they they compiled it with all the debug symbols. They can just flip one switch of the compiler on, and all of these are gone. All right. So I don't do that uh, anymore. Here is a this is a public rule. I didn't write these, but I wanted to show you guys just how it looks when you're adding, when you use more than one rule in one file. So when you run this in the Yara command line, it'll process all these rules and it'll look, you know, for all of these. It's going to be a or for each rule or an? It's going to match, It's it, they're independent of each other. One doesn't matter. It, it, if this matches, it'll tell you matched this string at this or. for this file. Is it gonna do, is it gonna yeah, do, it's a or. What is it gonna do, so, I imagine Yara will take these rules, compile them into its, whatever, right. detection engine, and then it'll run through each one of the binaries. Is it gonna do, okay, I run through all these binaries and I found this first rule, then I'm gonna run it again and do the second rule? Yeah, okay. all the rules are independent of each other. And this is where the flexibility of tags, so if you add a tag here, you know, and so or and let me ask or you, an if external I match, variable. If I match two rules in that file list, I'm going to see that file twice. Then is what I should expect. Yeah. Okay. But then you're also going to see the rule name. Sure, sure. Matched. That hit. Right. I get you. All right. 
So you know, so they have IPs here. Um, this was that the wiper malware that. Uh, which one is that? The Sony one. So it had a lot of different components. Strings and FBI advisory. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, <laughs> okay. that's probably right. right. that's, yeah, that's, 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 that's the meta tag. It doesn't matter. So you have the different uh, things, and, and here's one here's one thing to keep in mind is if you're using backslashes, uh, you have to escape them. them. Escape them. All right, so if you're using two backslashes, oh, yeah, it's going to be wiper. Yeah. That's the unknown wiper we're looking at. Yeah. Well, you know that they came up with a new one that was uh, uh, it was spread by SMB. It was not the one, the one we looked at, I guess is one of them, but there was the another one that was sprayed by an SMB, and it had in the, in the code, it did have like the, uh, the, the syntax to log in and the password, the places to put the, the, the passwords and everything. Oh, yeah? Yeah, that one, yeah. At that point, you were not, you were not there anymore, but you would have loved that one. Oh, shit, yeah. SMB, huh? Yeah. Nice. Okay. okay, so I do have some. I don't know if you guys. So is there is there like an automation portion of Yara? Or do you have to. Like, if you're running Mountree, is there an automated portion that will just run this stuff and then catalog it somewhere? Or? You can't. I mean, you can do that using the Python uh, library. The Python library allows you to scan files. And then you know anything you can do in Python. If you match a file, you get that return. So if I match this file, I'll move it here. If I match this file, send it over to this database. Something like that. But Yara itself doesn't do that. Yeah. So the the Yara executable is just worried about scanning and parsing rules. That's why it provides so you a library. Use a script, you you use a scripting language to call Yara to do your automated type. Right. But wait a minute. Yeah. You've been using it with the Cuckoo Bugs. That's, that's a way of automating, right? Yeah, but Cuckoo has code inside of the source code that actually processes. I'm just asking if there was like a David portion of Yara. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. No. Uh, you have to extend it to a way that you end up right. doing a sandbox. And yeah, that's true. Cool. Yeah, so like the, there was a project that I had on the PowerPoint where someone is actually using Yara to create an open source anti he wrote it uh, proof of concept and it works you know so he's gonna keep working on that project and it'll be a good project so it's pretty much anybody if you write any kind of rule upload it to that database and you have a much wider array of, of scanning instead of you know closed source and waiting for antiviruses to do their process of updating signatures you know you get it instantly with Yara So, uh, any questions? There are some, uh, like rule, 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 rule creators. You said there are snort rule creators, right? There are some. Um, Isn't well, there a website? There is there there yeah there's a couple of tools. There's Yara generator uh, right here on GitHub. The problem with them is that they're they're going through the file and they're grabbing the string data and they pick a random string data to add as your rule. Because Yara to write a good Yara rule, you have to understand your target. Oh of course. So these generators they they can't really understand how to parse. Unique so strings. Just what it's called, but it 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 right. right. So you're not gonna get that the robust rules that you can write by hand. Right. So. But yeah, the issues with the, the with the syntax and the the framework, it could help. But if you know the code that you're looking for, you want to be careful. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a starting point. It's definitely a starting point, but the learning curve for Yara is not difficult at all. Like I wouldn't even. Right. Uh, some of the strings that you were posting that you need some sort of an OS architecture, the memory knowledge in order to identify that. If you're gonna base it off just strings, it's you just run strings on the file. 
right. and then oh, you sift you and mean. you sift through the string. So, so if you have, you have to unpack it. You don't have to unpack it. You can identify it as a packed binary. So I have some samples here, right? right? And I can run strings on this malware sample. Say I don't know anything about this malware, but I want to look for more versions of it. So I run strings, redirect it to a file. And I'll look for any unique strings, right? I keep scrolling. I don't want to to get these gibberish string, strings. I want to get something that that is understandable. So I'll scroll. Uh, I don't want this. This is just a, a basic system system message. These are APIs. Now, I could use these, but a lot of programs might use these APIs. Right? So what I'm looking for is something a little more unique. And here's something. Right? I have a project database string. Right? I could use this string as an identifier. Um, but I wouldn't use this string because this string can go away. If they decide to compile it correctly. Oh, use Friday. Looks like charger. I don't know what malware this is. I picked it up from Virus Total, and um, you know we can we can definitely try to write some rules. But if you're gonna do it based based off string data, this is really all you have to do. Is that you just write you do strings a strings dump, yeah. and you look for unique strings. Now. It's, it's but a it lot would, of strings in this. It seems like file. it would be move you to actually look through the binary before you just write a yeah. rule based on the strings. So you know? for oh you could also like run it through hex dump, right? If, uh, yeah. If you see like like if it's a pre packed thing, they might have they might have a huge segment of what's jumped at the moment. Right? Oh, right. Goodness. Yes, this is not gonna work is it? huge empty spaces. All right, so I guess this uh, guest VM doesn't want to resize. So how does it feel to have a full uh, license of either? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, uh, Jack. Yeah, <laughs> like, please don't Jack. <laughs> it's, it, it feels different. So this is so this is the uh, the one I wrote that I showed you guys the Banjori file. File this one right here. So I'm going to show you guys exactly where. I guess the process, right? So A, so MZ is just uh, basic. This is a PE file. file. This is a Windows yeah. executable. Now, the entry point of the program starts right here, right? Now I'm not worried about what happens here, but here I have a relative call. Now when I see a call like this. As a malware analyst, that kind of jumps out to me. This just means that this file is trying to do some sort of position-independent code. So what this call does, it, it saves the EIP so that it understands what location in memory it's running. So that's suspicious to me. So I see this call, and here are the bytes. Originally, I wrote the rule with these sequence of bytes, but what's wrong with that? I have zeros, right? And so I was like, all right, that's not going to be good. Even Yara complained about this rule. This this particular string is slowing down the scan. I was like, all right. So I extended it to the next two bytes. Now, I did say, oh, this is a function prolog. Don't use a function prolog. But I used it with the relative call. So you have call plus five, and the call jumps here. So this sequence of instructions is always going to happen because it wants to get the previous instruction pointer and then, want to and, then, and then it wants to save the stack. So I use this sequence of bytes, right? And we can see that right here. 558BEC. And here's that sequence of bytes. This sequence of bytes happens within 100 bytes of the entry point. Uh, I did the math. I have to worry about it. 
But all this, I think it's up until somewhere down here. So if it finds this sequence of bytes within the first 100 bytes in the entry point, we have a match. Now, another interesting that this mal another interesting thing that this malware does is it uses hashes to call APIs. So it doesn't use the API names, it pre-computes a hash of the APIs and then it grabs them. It has a lookup table. It's very common in malware now. They don't use names because it's much faster to use a hash. Yeah. So I have I found this hash. It calls this function which resolves that hash into an API name. And I have this hash. I have other hashes. There's a lot more. There's a lot more other hashes. What I'm particularly interested in is the sequence of instructions right here. Right, so that's just EF, EF right here, E2, 97, BF, and this is just the opcode for move, EAX. So I took that sequence of bytes, which are my B, C, and D. All these are different hashes. I use this the second the next sequence of bytes as well because I determined that this was significant. Yeah, because like I said, in memory it's little Indian. But, but I'm not looking I'm not looking for this, I'm looking for the byte sequence. And if you're searching a data stream, you're gonna get the little Indian version of that byte sequence. Right, so I'm looking for it in this in hex dump it'll look like this. But of course, okay. when you are always matches on what would be the next. Yeah, the data stream. Yar doesn't match against literal assembler unless somebody writes a module for it. Right? So I have this byte sequence. I also have this hash sequence. Just pushing this particular hash. And the reason why I included the increase and push here, for some reason, it decided to use. The hash that's one byte less than the actual hash. So you move this hash into EAX and you increase it by one. That's the real hash. And then it pushes that hash on the stack. So this is a fake hash. <laughs> so I had so originally I looked at it and I was like, okay, why is it increasing? And then when I looked in this function, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. So so I did that. No, I did it with this one only. So you see here, you have to push. So this is the actual yeah, so uh, thing. And I was able to actually rewrite that that hashing algorithm and, and, and verify it. So yeah, so here it does that. Um, and it has a few other ones. Here goes other hashes and stuff. So I have that relative call and all the hashes. And that's what I wanna match. To identify this particular malware. Malware or using any you feel like using it in. So, so it's, it's just yeah. yeah. You can pass it. You can pass it any kind of data data stream. Like I call it data streams. I don't, I don't like calling it binaries or files. You can use it anywhere. Binary. Yeah. Yeah. Binary or cat whatever. Yeah. And then. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's really nice. Um, a little, you know, just kind of complete the demonstration. I mean, you could almost write like a binary search engine. Right? Yeah, it has a lot of potential. Um, you know, just because it's it's still new. But I know a lot of companies are using it internally, like for some badass stuff. So you know, for here we have. You can use this to find all the binaries libraries and then use that to exploit those for writing uh, you can do any kind of triage with that. Yeah. <laughs> so here I'm, I'm gonna run the uh, the Banjori one against a directory that has all the Banjori samples that I was looking at and that's how I test to see if the rule works so we run Yara if we do help we'll see all the different options I usually run standard print strings, which will print the matching strings, and G, which prints my tags. I use tags a lot just so I know which rules I want to, you know, 
to filter out the output. Now when it does the, um, like I saw like the, the one in the wiper, it had the description as the FBI meta. advisory. You can, add, that, that'll be done you can have that if you pass print meta. So if you have M, you can print the meta tag as well. So I run SG, uh, the Android file, uh, ER, and then where am I? I have to find the rules. Yeah, I have to find the uh, directory that my uh oh that my malware is in. Uh, you can scan recursively. You just have to pass R to the command line. All right. So in this directory, I have all the Benjori uh, malware files, and I run it. I want to run this rule file against all the, the files in that directory. When I press enter, and here we have. All right. So we have all the matches that happen. You'll see that particular byte sequence that I was trying to match, all the hashes that showed up, all these files matched. All right. So what are, I'm sorry, what, what's the hex all the way to the left? Is that the line that it found it? The offset. Oh, uh, okay. That's, this is the offset in which it found that matching oh, okay. string. This is my identifier that I used, and then this is the, uh, the strings data. So, you know, another interesting thing about this piece, piece of malware is that B is always, uh, I think, 23 bytes away from A. I could have used that as well. Sure. In my hex string, I could have been yeah, there. And 23 actually, bytes I, from I, I here, didn't, match on this. Yeah, and I didn't show you guys this, but you don't have to put, you know, a bunch of, uh, of question marks. So if I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 bytes, Here's another tricky thing I can do. This. Oh, is that, and that's an eight byte wildcard? Yeah. yeah. So this is a wildcard. This is kind of like. A variable like a wildcard. Like. Wait, sorry. But like if I wanted to do. do um, you can also do things like. Um, what was it? Here's another one. Uh, eight, six, eight, or four, five. So in this particular byte, I can either you can either have sixty-eight or forty-five there. That's nice. Yeah. It makes the conditions easier to write. Right. Right. It makes the conditions yeah easier to write. That way you don't have to write. We're missing a curly brace at the end of there. Or have to nitpick. That was not a real rule. I was trying to write that <laughs> from there. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, so the string data, and, and this is all in documentation. If you want to see all the other cool things you can do with the strings or the conditions, it's one page in the documentation. And then you can just play around with it. So you can write different rules in different ways. Um, it just depends on, on how you want to write it. I, I, I ping the authors to see if there's any performance uh, differences between writing rules different ways. That's a hard question to answer. So. Benchmarking as far as their there is no, there's no, there's no. Probably other researchers have done some benchmarking. I think big AV houses that use a whole shitload of Yara rules have done some benchmarking. But me, I, I use I use Yara rules sparingly. I use it on you know personal projects. So. Yeah. So, any questions, concerns, comments, complaints? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a very powerful tool. Uh, yeah, I hope it gets uh, the mainstream uh, presence that it deserves. Cause it's a well-written tool. It's open source, so if you want to improve it anyway, just grab the source and and do pull requests. The author is really friendly, and he he accepts any kind of pull requests that you want to get. So, and it's an. And that concludes the, our presentation. Awesome. Let me stop this stream.